to our uh, weekly Innovative Discovery Series. We are very excited today to have Dr. Reisman for uni from University of Delaware to discuss functional recovery after stroke. But before I introduce our speaker, let me go over some housekeeping issues. So all the CME credit instructions are on the screen. Uh, and we can also uh, email you instructions if you provide your address on the signing sheet. Our next uh, discovery series will be March 20th, and we'll have just Dr. Justin Martello from Christiana Care to talk about Parkinson's, uh, Parkinson's disease. And so, as usual, please register through the Christiana Care portal. And our full ID series schedule is posted on the Accel CTR website. Our, we have a tech talk early in March, which will be March 5th, and it's Dr. Laura Balzer from University of Massachusetts who will talk about machine learning for causal inference. And I would really, really recommend you to hear her talk. This is just a, a wonderful talk. I've, I've, I've listened to her, and, and she's just wonderful. So mach machine learning for causal inference on March 5th. So I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Reisman. Dr. Reisman is currently full professor with tenure in the Department of Physical Therapy at University of Delaware, and she's also the chair of the Department of Physical Therapy. She obtained a PhD in biomechanics and movement science at University of Delaware. She's currently the PI on two hour ones, two large grants, and co-investigator on multiple grants. And she has been uh, extensively, extensively funded by NIH and the American Heart Association over the years. She's a teacher, she has mentored numerous students, and several of them are here, I think, postdoctorate fellows and faculty. She has received many awards, the last one in 2018 when she uh, obtained the University of Delaware Mid-Career Excellence in Scholarship. She has also multiple peer-reviewed publications, and she's well-known at Christiana Care, as she has talked at several neurology grand rounds and stroke-related conferences. But last time she presented at our Friday noon conference was in 2009, so it was just time that she came back. So thank you so much, and we look forward to your talk. All right, thanks so much, everybody, for coming. I love coming to Christiana Care um, because I have my roots in um, patient care, so I um, got my PT degree, and then I practiced for about seven years um, in primarily neuro rehab, working with patients with stroke, Parkinson's disease, traumatic brain injury, before I went back to Delaware to get my PhD. So I love coming back um, and talking to people who are mainly, you know, doing the work in the clinic, because um, that's where my roots are, and, and that's one of my first loves. I also am the academic director of the Neurologic and Older Adult Clinic at the University of Delaware, and so get to... Um, feed my clinical um, itch every once in a while consulting down in the clinic. So um, really appreciate all you guys and, and know all the hard work that you're doing out there. Um, today I want to talk about recover, recovery of functional mobility after stroke. And I'm particularly going to focus on um, some of our work really related to walking in the real world. So the goal of the work that uh, my lab is doing at the University of Delaware is to develop scientifically based therapies to advance rehabilitation and recovery after stroke. And we really base all of our work um, in the framework of the World Health Organization ICF model. So how many of you are familiar with this? Few hands. Okay, let me just quickly go through it. So some of the PTs, this is um, something that a lot of um, PT schools teach to sort of embed, um, embed our education in this. So the World Health Organization ICF model, it's, ICF stands for International Classification of Functioning um, is this idea that you have a health condition. In our case, we're going to be talking today about stroke. And really, that health condition affects body function and structure. It also affects activity, and then it affects participation. And you'll notice that those arrows are bi-directional, right? So this, the idea here is that your participation in the real world affects activity. So activity in the, in the world of a physical therapist might be, you know, how far can you walk when I test you in, in, the, in the clinic? but also is related to body function and structure. So if I have a stroke and I have um, paresis of my lower extremity, right, that's affecting you know, my body function, um, may affect my body structure if those muscles in that lower extremity start to really atrophy, and that in turn affects my activity and participation. But if I have that paresis as a basis and then I sit on my couch all day and don't do anything, right? 
that can cycle back and affect my body function, my body function and structure by just having traditional muscle atrophy that anybody would have, right, from not being active, right? So you can see how these things are all interrelated. And this is going to become really important as we talk later. And then also, all of these things are affected by environmental factors and personal factors. So we really have to be thinking about, in our view, no matter what problem we're trying to tackle, we really have to be thinking um, at all of these different levels. Because if we ignore one level, probably the chances of us um, really having an impact on that person's life long term are going to be limited. Any questions about this model? Does this make sense? This is sort of the, the basis of everything. Okay, so I don't think I have to tell the people in this room, lots of people have strokes in the United States every year and it causes disability and it causes lots of, of cost, both monetarily and um, for the, the human person. One of the primary concerns for people after they've had a stroke is um, the ability to regain walking function. And this, this um, focus is really well-founded because we know that walking function predicts lots of other things. It predicts who's gonna return to being able to live at home. It predicts who's gonna be able to go back to work. Um, I don't know how many of you have um, heard about, uh, close to 10 years ago now there was a seminal study which also showed that walking speed was really related to mortality just in an older adult population. And that work hasn't been done specifically in stroke, but you can imagine that um, probably there's similar relationships. So because walking is such a focus um, for the person, um, it's also really a focus of what we do in rehabilitation. And so we really are, in the case of someone who's had a stroke, thinking about walking retraining, right? The person already knows how to walk, but now there's been changes in their body function and structure due to the stroke that are um, impacting their ability to walk. We know that 70 to 80% of stroke survivors recover the ability to walk short distances, like around their house and maybe um, you know, from a, a handicapped parking spot into a building. But less than 20% recover unlimited walking in the community. And this is the kind of walking ability that we all want to have, right? We all want to be able to go where we want to go, when we want to go, and under our own power. And so this 20%, while, while the 70 to 80% is terrific, the 20% not so good when we're really thinking about the whole person and we're thinking about what they want to be able to do um, with the rest of their life. Um, current locomotor interventions, while beneficial, don't really lead to functional, functional community locomotion after stroke as evidenced by this 20% value. So when we think about walking recovery, again, it's embedded in that ICF model. And so we're really taking a look at lots of different factors that really influence walking recovery, right? You have these different domains. I'm gonna to try to use my cursor so that people on the, um, on the video can see um, what, I'm, what I'm pointing to. So motor learning. Motor learning is the foundation of, of rehabilitation, right? We're trying to teach people to do things that they um, are having trouble doing because of whatever um, um, disability or, or problem they're currently having. Then there's biomechanics, right? This is how my, my limbs and my joints and my muscles um, act. Then there's neurophysiology in the case of stroke, right? What happened to the brain and how has that changed? Um, how that brain um, communicates with the rest of the body. There are biopsychosocial factors that are really important. We know about the incidence of post-stroke depression, for example, that can really have a major impact on recovery. We also know that um, things like who you live with, where you live, what your access is to different kinds of healthcare and rehabilitation um, can really impact this recovery. And then last but not least, we also have cardiovascular physiology. So in the case of stroke, people obviously have um, generally an issue with cerebrovascular, right? But often when you have cerebrovascular problems, you have concomitant cardiovascular problems. And if you don't, the sedentary lifestyle that can often accompany stroke can lead to the development of those cardiovascular problems. So um, I want to mention that we have a lot of work going on um, right now in the realm of motor learning and how cognition interfaces um, in people post-stroke with their ability um, to motor learn, which I think is probably really of interest to the, the PTs um, in the audience. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be talking about that today, just in the interest of time and thinking about um, a more general audience here today. But um, I just want to let you know we're doing this work, and I would be happy to, um, to, to speak with, with folks about that if we have time at the end. Instead, what I'm going to be really focusing on today is, in general, how these factors really interact um, to promote walking recovery or hinder walking recovery after stroke. 
So one of the biggest problems um, in walking recovery after stroke is that stroke survivors walk slowly. Slow walking speed is really a hallmark impairment um, from a mobility standpoint after stroke. Walking speed is one of the most commonly analyzed measures that we use um, in studies that are trying to promote post-stroke walking recovery. And I have this example here from the LEAPS trial. The LEAPS trial was the largest study ever of walking recovery after stroke. And um, what they found, their, their main um, outcome measure here, you can see on the y-axis was walking speed. On the x-axis is um, the different time points they measured walking speed. And um, <clears throat> what you can see is that regardless of the group that you were in, and I won't get into those details, um, everybody sort of at one year recovered to basically the same place in their walking speed. This is a problem we have in rehab, right? We know that something is better than nothing, right? But we don't know which of those somethings is, is better than the, than the other thing. And this is a real problem if we're trying to optimize recovery. And so we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that today um, and how we can start to look at different factors um, and, and start to target intervention specifically to subgroups. The other problem that we, we think is very related to slow walking speed is the fact that in general, and by the way, everything I'm talking about today is group I'm a researcher, right? So I talk about groups. We are going to be talking about subgroups. I know everybody treats individuals. They don't treat groups. And so there's exceptions to all of the group data that I'm showing today. And I just want to uh, make that obviously really clear. Um, this is data from our lab really showing um, that the interaction between walking speed and steps per day. So there was a seminal study that was done by Jacqueline Perry back in 1995, where she um, really was able to relate for the first time walking speed to what people really report being able to do in the real world. And she was able to classify folks as mainly being household ambulators, that's HHA um, in this figure, limited community ambulators, or the UCA, unlimited community ambulators. And so we were really interested in, um, as technology developed, we were able to have devices that could really accurately measure steps per day in the real world in people with stroke. And this is really, has been, was really a challenge up until about 12 or so years ago, where all of the pedometers that were on the market were inaccurate for people with asymmetric and slow walking speed. But there were some research grade devices um, developed that were um, quite accurate and, and um, were able to tell us um, what people in, in the real world um, were able to do after their stroke um, in terms of walking. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to say, okay, so Jacqueline Perry in 1995 did this analysis with um, qualitative reporting from patients about what they did in the real world and linked that up with walking speed. And we wanted to say, okay, now if we objectively measure the steps per day that you're taking in the real world, how does that match up with your walking speed? And this data is really interesting because what it shows us is that in terms of steps per day, there's really no difference between these household ambulators and these limited community ambulators. They're both taking um, you know, very limited steps per day. And so if you combine them together in a group, what you can see is there are significant differences in steps per day between these household um, and limited community ambulators, the unlimited community ambulators, and then healthy age match controls, with the healthy age match controls taking the most steps per day. Um, there was a large systematic review that was done um, back in 2014, looking at average daily step counts in people with stroke. And what they showed is this varies quite widely from about 1,400 steps per day to about um, 7,000 steps per day, whereas the age match controls, it's uh, about 6,000 steps per day all the way up to almost 15,000 steps per day. So again, this slide is really meant to show you um, that, that after stroke, people tend to walk fewer steps per day um, than age match healthy controls, and that that is somewhat linked to their walking speed or their capacity. So um, many of you from the Excel program will, will recognize this guy down here. This is Stuart Benner McLeod. Um, Stuart and I um, had a, a large grant um, a number of years ago to look at interventions um, specifically to try to tackle um, walking speed after stroke. And I had been doing a series of studies um, looking at fast walking. So just having people walk, with stroke walk faster than, than their comfortable speed, either on a treadmill or overground. And what we showed from those studies was that um, biomechanics of walking, the, the position of the limbs relative to each other and in space, are actually better when you make patients walk faster. 
Stuart, if you guys know, is a functional electrical stimulation guy. So we had a marriage of fast walking and functional electrical stimulation. And the reason we did that is because Stuart's functional electrical stimulation could be applied to the gastric muscles or the calf muscles that are really responsible in gait for propelling you forward, right? And so the problem is in patients with stroke though, if you stimulate their, their gastroc soleus, I'm gonna step, I don't know where the camera is, I'm gonna step out of maybe the view of the camera for a minute to demonstrate. So if you have patients um, with stroke, if you stimulate their gastrocs and you don't couple it with fast walking speed, typically speaking, their paretic limb is not far enough behind their body. And so when I stimulate their gastrocs, instead of that pushing me forward, it causes me to march, okay? So in order for this functional electrical stimulation to be effective, you have to get the limbs sufficiently behind the body as it would be for all of us in walking then when you stimulate that gastric muscle, that calf muscle, it pushes you forward. The reason that's so important is that propulsive force is really critically related to walking speed, okay? So if you have more propulsive force, you can walk faster. So long story short, five years of blood, sweat, and tears on our part and on the part of all of our participants, um, we found that this fast FES intervention, as well as fast walking, both do a better job of improving walking speed. We have a lot of different measures here. In this case, I'm showing you the six minute walk um, difference. These are measures of energy cost. They do a better job, this is um, pre, post, and follow up, of improving these measures of walking function than just training at patient's comfortable speed, okay? So we were pretty excited about those results, but there's always a but in research, right? What we found when we put our fancy pedometers on them was that even though we had improved their speed, what do you think happened to their real, real world walking? Goose egg, nothing. Okay, so I just showed you some data on the previous slide. We improved their six minute walk. We improved measures of, of, of energy. We improved um, walking speed, but it wasn't translating to home. And this is, um, this is really important. We're gonna get to that later. We do know now, we just put together, uh, put out um, a clinical practice guideline. This is um, one of the first clinical practice, well, is the first clinical practice guideline um, for looking at uh, recovery of walking function in patients with neurologic condition. And I happen to be part of, um, whoops, part of the team. And we know over, um, through this clinical practice guideline, that it's generally accepted now that walking training at higher intensities appears to improve walking speed and walking endurance more than training at, at lower intensities. So you could think of this in terms of walking speed, right? So just allowing patients to practice walking at their normal speed does not result in as big improvements in walking speed and walking function as if you train them at higher intensities, okay? Um, so one of the things that you could think about is if, if there's this vicious cycle after stroke where people are physically inactive, it leads to disability, it increases their health risk. Now again, think back to that ICF model, right? So I told you that um, slow walking speed and slow and poor endurance are ways, are things that we can affect, right? By training at higher intensities. So we were really interested in looking at <clears throat> this interaction with physical inactivity. And unfortunately, what you find that I alluded to earlier, not just from our studies, but from many other studies, is that training at higher intensities does not generally result in substantial changes in real world walking, okay? So I can change someone's physical capacity, right? I can change their walking speed, I can change their walking endurance, but it's not gonna automatically transfer into what they're doing in the real, real world. How many people in this room does that surprise? Right, I mean, they're, they're, it, they, it's difficult, right? Even though, even though we've improved their six minute walk, we've improved their walking speed, it's still sometimes very difficult for them to get around. So <clears throat> uh, we now know that physical capacity accounts for only about 35 to 40% of the variance in real world walking activity. Okay, so if I just address those physical capacity measures, which by the way, I'm a PT, that's what I do, right? That's what I think about mostly. Um, we know that that's gonna, ha that all accounts for only 35 to 40% of the variance. There's all these other factors 
that impact real world walking. And if I'm not addressing them, I'm probably not gonna have, if I'm only addressing that physical capacity, I'm probably not gonna have the influence on the real world walking that I would like. And for the PTs in the room, how many of you, how many of you are familiar with sort of the revolving door of therapy? Right? Patients have stroke, they come in, they get therapy, they do better, and oh, lo and behold, a year later, they're back, right? And it's, it, it, we think in part it's because we're not doing a good job of getting what we're doing in terms of capacity building into the real, real world, and part of it is because there may be all these other factors we're not addressing. Okay, so one of the things that we looked at early on when we saw this data, which by the way was kind of devastating to me, you know, I was so excited about these results of this FAST FES project, and then to find out, well, I didn't really actually impact their real lives at all. They did better on my measurements in the clinic, but who cares, right? We started to really get interested in this and wanted to investigate this. And one of the things that had been showing up um, early on in the literature was this idea of balanced self-efficacy. So this is how confident do I feel, right, in my balance when I'm out and about mobilizing in the world. And so we did a, a study um, with a group of patients um, and showed that this balanced self-efficacy really moderates the relationship between walking capacity and steps per day. And that's shown here in this figure. So we measured self-efficacy using um, the ABC, the Activity Specific Balance Confidence Scale. The, we measured walking capacity by the functional gait assessment. The reason we use the FGA, this is a test that has folks doing lots of things, walking over obstacles, walking forward and backward. And we thought this was a fair test of capacity, right? Because it has things, people doing things, not just walking in a straight line, things that they might be doing in the real world. And then on the y-axis, we have steps per day. And what you can see here, these lines represent um, people with low ABC scores, the average ABC scores in the group, or the high ABC scores in the group. And then um, what you see here is folks that were one standard deviation below the mean on the FGA, at the mean, or above. And what you can see is that the slope of the line here for those with low ABC is positive, meaning that um, there's a, a, a reasonably strong relationship between FGA and steps per day if your ABC is low. But look at what happens if your ABC is high. That line is flat, okay? And so what that suggests is that even if you have a low FGA score or low physical capacity, if you have high self-efficacy, you can still have higher steps per day, right? Because this dot is, is higher on the y-axis. Does that make sense to everybody? Say it again. Why doesn't well, that's a really great question. We think that there's probably um, sort of, there's a little bit of a problem with the measure of the ABC in the sense that this is a measure of people's self-efficacy. So you can have people down here who are actually overestimating. So they, they have more confidence than they probably should given their physical capacity. Does that make sense? So. For the, the PTs and the rehab folks in the room, this is the person where they're telling you all the stuff they're doing outside and you're like, oh my gosh. Well, maybe we shouldn't actually, you know, be climbing that ladder up to the up to the <laughs> roof. Does that make sense, Claudine? Yeah. Okay. So um, back in 2018, there was a um, another systematic review and meta-analysis that came out um, that showed really that there are across studies, there are these non-modifiable effects non-modifiable factors that really influence um, daily walking activity after stroke. And then there's these potentially modifiable factors that sort of came out um, over, over um, looking at lots of different studies. So physical function, fatigue, self-efficacy, both the false self-efficacy scale as well as the balanced self-efficacy scale, depression and health-related quality of life. So these are variables that are probably all influencing physical activity after stroke. So we're really taking a two-pronged approach to trying to <clears throat> look at and understand physical activity after stroke. The first approach that we're taking is really to, to try to design um, interventions that attack more than just physical capacity. And the other approach that we're taking is really trying to identify subgroups of people so that we can really understand which of these variables we should be targeting. Okay, and I wanna talk about that for a little bit um, more here. This is very new, um, I don't usually do this. This is data that is not published, but I wanted to share it with you guys today. I think there's people in this um, room who might have some really good, um, really good feedback for us. 
So we already know <clears throat> from some work that's done that there are some there are some studies showing that there are subgroups of people <coughs> when it comes to walking behavior. But these studies um, have not been very um, inclusive in all of the variables that they're looking at. So <coughs> we really wanted to take a more comprehensive approach to looking at a wide variety of variables to understand what really distinguishes these subgroups. So <coughs> this is the other reason I wanted to present this data today. So we're doing um, a four-site clinical trial called ProWox, and Christiana Care um, is one of the sites. Dr. Razor Shram is the PI, um, the site PI, and then the, the therapists down at Springside are implementing the intervention. <clears throat> and so we have um, a lot of baseline data. We can't um, look at anything else besides the baseline data because we have not <coughs> ended the clinical trial yet. But we have a lot of baseline data where we're collecting a lot of variables as well as um, steps per day that we can use to start to look at this. <coughs> Sorry, I've got an um, allergy drainage problem. All right, so this work is really being led by Allison Miller. She's a PT um, and an NCS, neuroclinical specialist, who's um, in my lab getting her PhD. And Ryan Polig, who many of you may know, um, <clears throat> is a biostatistician at UD. So this is basic, the basic characteristics of the study sample. We have 249 participants so far. This is just some basic information about them. <clears throat> and the, the statistical analysis approach that we're going to use here is something called latent class analysis. And what this approach tries to do is it takes a group of people and it tries to separate them out into homogeneous groups that do not overlap with each other, okay? So we have this example here of all these people and each person is represented by a different color. And what latent class analysis does is it tries to group all the red people together, all the yellow people together, and all the green people together without mushing the red and yellow. So you try to have these distinct sub subgroups, okay? <clears throat> the variables of interest that we were going to use to try to subgroup people come from that meta-analysis, talking about all the different variables that may be um, important. Um, but no study had really put all of these variables together in a single analysis, and that's what we were trying to do. We were, of course, limited by the variables that we were collecting through the ProWalk study. So in the area of physical capacity, we have the six-minute walk test and self-selected gait speed. In the area of cognition, we have the Montreal Cognitive um, Assessment, the MOCA. In the area of physical health, we have measures of um, their LDLs, the Charleston Comorbidity Index, and their BMI. In the psychosocial area, we have the ABC scale I talked about earlier, and we have the patient um, health questionnaire, which is this is a screening tool for depression. For representing the social and physical environment, we have information about their living situation, their marital status, the area deprivation index, and the walk score. And these are scores that basically use um, people's addresses um, to help understand how walkable um, their air, the area that they're living in and how socioeconomically um, advent advantageous or deprived the area is that they live in. And so um, I won't get into all the statistical details, but I have some hidden slides just for Claudine at the end if she wants to see them um, about all the analysis that we did in terms of in, 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 in ending up with three classes. But uh, suffice it to say, we did the latent class analysis. And um, what happens when you do the latent class analysis is it comes up with lots of different choices for subgroups, right? You could have it starts with, you know, you can have a subgroup of two, you can have a subgroup of three, a subgroup of four, a subgroup of five, et cetera. And um, what you do is you use um, different um, tests to try to understand which of those different choices of subgroups best represents your data. And so I'll talk, I can talk about that at the end if people want to know more details. But essentially, through doing all of those tests, we ended up with a model, um, the best model that had three subgroups um, based on that model selection criteria. And so we had group one um, with uh, 60 people, group two with 81 people, and group um, three with 108 people. Now, the next thing that you do in latent class analysis is you... Um, figure out which variables were actually important in subgrouping these people. And now we're getting down to what we're interested in, right? We want to know what are the variables that are contributing to people being in each of these different groups. 
What you can see by the way I'm talking is this is a very patient-centered approach, okay? This is different than like hierarchical regression, right? Here we're trying to understand what category, what variables categorize people into a certain subgroup. And the reason I like this as a physical therapist is because this is how we think about people. We think about them not as groups, but as individuals and how do they, what are the characteristics that they um, possess that I might want to be able to address. So the variables in red are the variables that, that came out of the analysis that allowed us to subgroup people. So we have in walking capacity, we have the six minute walk test and the gait speed. Um, nothing in cognition, nothing in physical health, but in the psychosocial arena, we have the ABC. And in the social and physical environment, we have those two measures I was telling you that give us some information about how, walk how walkable the area is and that they live in and how, um, so how economically um, deprived or enriched the area is. And so let's talk about these group differences in physical capacity. So group one is the folks that had the lowest six minute walk test score and group three is the group that had the highest six minute walk test score. Same with self-selected walking speed, okay? In the psychosocial domain, those with the lowest ABC score were in group one and those with the highest ABC score were in group three. Okay, and these are all um, significant differences between these groups. Gets a little more complicated with the environmental piece. For the area deprivation index, um, higher numbers mean higher deprivation. So group one lived in an area um, of more economic deprivation and group three lived in an area of less economic de deprivation. Um, in better walkability, in the uh, walk score, higher numbers indicate better walkability. So in this case, it was a little more complicated Group two is the group that had the, lived in the most walkable area, followed by group one and um, finally group three. Okay, so these were the most important factors that distinguished these subgroups um, and they included measures of physical capacity, self-efficacy and the environment. But what we were really interested in now is do these subgroups actually um, map onto, if you will, differences in steps per day? Okay, because that's what we're really trying to understand. So we, you, once you've finished um, looking at your subgroups, then you look to see if in your, for your variable of interest, in our case steps per day, whether that variable actually significantly differs across groups, right? And it, it might not. And if it didn't, then it would tell you that these subgroups exist, but they don't have anything to do with steps per day. Okay, so in our case, this is like, I'm gonna spill this for sure. Let me put this down. Um, so in our case, um, we, were, we were, of course, going into this, we put variables in the model that we thought had an impact on steps per day, right? So we were, we were looking um, and, and expecting to see that it would um, differentiate, and indeed it does. So average steps per day is lowest in group one and highest in group three, okay? So what this really tells us at this point is that you have group one with low walking activity, low physical capacity, low self-efficacy, and at least for the ADI, um, challenges with the environment in that they're in the, the uh, in, live in a more um, lower socio or lower economic area. Group three is exactly the opposite. Okay. So the clinical relevance of this is we need to really understand these different characteristics. Okay, so in my group, my group one, if I just address their low physical capacity, I'm not gonna have an effect, right? I pr or probably have a limited effect. I probably also need to address their low self-efficacy. Now there's not much I can do about their economic condition, myself as a physical therapist, but I need to understand that that's a factor and I need to understand how that might be impacting their physical activity. And I need, that's gonna lead me to ask different questions and maybe make different recommendations. So the idea is that when we have this more rich understanding of the different factors that are contributing to something that we're trying to target, then we can design interventions that actually target these different subgroups, right? So in my, my high physical capacity, high self-efficacy subgroup, I'm gonna target different things than in my um, low physical capacity, low self-efficacy subgroup. So this leads us on now to our work with intervention. 
So I told you already that just doing high intensity walking training, while it has good improvements on physical capacity, it doesn't translate to everyday walking. But we just talked about some of these environmental factors and self-efficacy, right? And how they do um, potentially play a role. So now I'm gonna talk about um, some things that we're doing to try to address that. Um, we developed a step activity monitoring program, and this is a, um, this is a program that's based on what has been done um, in research in patients with diabetes and heart failure. And what they found is that the key ingredients um, to helping people in those two groups improve um, their walking through some kind of step activity monitoring program is you've got to have um, something that's actually going to give them feedback about how many steps a day they're taking. Um, it involves them setting a goal. Right, So it's not just about monitoring how many steps they're taking, it's about having them have a goal they're trying to reach each day, but also um, identifying barriers and strategies to overcome them. And this is where that environmental piece comes in. So at each session, patients are told the number of steps per day they've taken. Um, that, you know, that I'll talk to you a little bit about how we've implemented this. In the case of using the Fitbit, they can just look at the Fitbit and see how many steps per day they're taking. And we talk about that relative to their goal achievement. Um, and really, in this case, the role of the PT is really as facilitator, right? We're not big brother saying, why didn't you take your you know, goal number of steps on Tuesday, right? Rather, we're trying to understand if they hit their goal on Wednesday but not on Tuesday, what was different about, what was different about Wednesday? How could we capitalize on what happened on Wednesday on other days? Um, and we're really using motivational interviewing techniques. <clears throat> when we're doing this. And the goal is really to try to help um, think about change from the patient's perspective, right? That really in order for long-standing behavioral change to occur, the patient has to really figure out how to make that change and has to really own that change. So after we implemented a program like this in a small sample of people, what we did, they came in once a week um, for four weeks. And you can see that we had, this is about a 1500 step increase just in that short amount of time, really suggesting that this kind of step activity monitoring program can have um, a, an effect on people's behavior by really talking with them and identifying <clears throat> some of those psychosocial factors and some of those barriers and facilitators. So if they would say to us, you know, I'm really, really concerned when I walk outside about falling, and so I don't walk outside. They have low balance self-efficacy. That's something that we've got to address, and we'll talk about how we do that later, right, in order for that person to see improvements. But we also mentioned, right, that physical capacity was a big piece of this. So we also have to address their physical capacity. So um, we did a, a small clinical trial where we combined, we had one group that just did fast walking, on the treadmill and overground, and another group that had the FAST plus SAM, um, <clears throat> SAM standing for Step Activity Monitoring Program. So they came in, they did the physical capacity building. At the same time, they were wearing the Step Activity Monitor, they were setting the goals, and we were having those conversations with them. One thing that we do in our fast walking is we do part of the training on the treadmill, and then we do overground training. And one of the things that we're discovering through our motivational interviewing-like sessions is what are, the, what are the things that the person is having difficulty with around the home or outside that are limiting them from wanting to be more active? And then those are things that we're practicing when we're doing the overground training at the fast speed. So we hypothesize that those with low levels of baseline activity would benefit the most. Um, and indeed, that's what we saw. And you can see this here. Um, I think it's easiest just for in the interest of time to focus on this graph over here, where um, the folks with low levels of um, physical activity to start with benefited the most from the FAST plus SAM intervention. This was a very small study, um, probably really shouldn't even be showing you these, these outcomes because it wasn't powered to, to look at that, but I just want to set the stage for what this led to, which is our next big study, which we're doing now, which is the ProWalk study. So in the ProWalk study now, we've expanded. Um, so that study I showed you earlier was really a feasibility study, a proof of concept study. Now we've expanded to the, the ProWalk study where we're, we're doing the same thing. We're having the FAST group, the FAST plus SAM group, but now we've added just a step activity monitoring um, group alone. As I mentioned, um, Christiana Care is one of the sites. Um, 
and this is basically the, the basic study design. Folks come in for baseline testing. They have to have a submaximal exercise test to ensure that they're safe to participate. They get randomized. They do post-testing, and then we have six- and 12-month um, follow-ups. So our primary outcomes are steps per day. We have secondary outcomes of the six-minute walk test, the walking speed, and energy cost. And then we have an exploratory outcome related to secondary prevention where we're trying to understand um, whether or not we're having an effect on um, their actual uh, physical health. And so what, what I want you to take away from this is that what we've done is we've tried to understand these different subgroups of patients and then tailor interventions. So in pro walks, we're not subgrouping them, right? In pro walks, it, we're taking all comers. But the idea is that we've developed the, so, so our hypothesis for pro walks actually is not that, so typically, I should mention this, so typically you would think that the FAST plus SAM group, which is our true experimental condition, right? That we would hypothesize that that group is gonna win. But we didn't. We actually hypothesized that that group was gonna win for a subgroup of people. Does that make sense? So um, this is another way we're trying to understand if you tailor an intervention um, for people's particular characteristics and the things that are particularly difficult for them, can you see better outcomes than if you don't? So that's another way we're looking at um, trying to understand how um, we can influence physical activity by really understanding the different things that are contributing to a particular person's um, low level of physical activity. So stay tuned. Um, it's going to be a while, but we'll let you know um, what happens with ProWalks, believe me, when, when we finally get those results. I also just wanted to quickly mention, there's a lot of really cool things going on at the University of Delaware relative to um, um, working with patients with stroke. So in addition to doing the latent class analysis, we're also using some um, machine learning approaches to looking at this data to try to understand also how the machine learning can help us cluster and group people. And that work is happening with Yosef Kim in physical therapy and um, Vu in the um, Data Science Center. We also have a lot of different work going on with robotics, and I should have put a new picture on here of Jennifer Semro, who's a fairly new faculty member who's doing work with um, upper extremity um, in the area of robotics, but also in the area of understanding um, sensation and proprioception and how that affects control of the upper extremity. Jeremy Crenshaw is doing a lot of works with, with me with balance and falls in patients with um, stroke. He has a very cool treadmill that he can induce slips, trips, and falls in the treadmill, and then we can do training interventions to try to get people to be able to correct from that. Believe me, they're in a harness. It's all good, but um, it's that's pretty cool because, again, this, this collaboration with Jeremy, Jeremy had been working with older adults, but this collaboration came about when we started to look at balanced self-efficacy. And one of the ways you build people's balanced self-efficacy is to put them in difficult situations and teach them how to deal with it, right? And so that's partly where Jeremy's work comes in. Then Elisa Arch and Stephen Stanhope, um, I also collaborate with them. They're doing some really nice work in building custom orthotics for patients with stroke who are um, that really allow them to generate that propulsive force. So anybody who's ever worn a solid AFO knows that you can't actually plantar flex very well in it. Therefore, you can't actually generate propulsive force. This is a huge problem when it comes to gait speed, right? Because I told you earlier that generating that propulsive force is necessary to walk faster. So. Um, in, along with the Center for Composite Materials at Delaware, they're, they're developing these really cool customized AFOs that, can, AFOs that can return energy and allow some of that propulsion to occur. So we're working on those projects. And then we also, I'm part of a multi-site clinical trial, whoops, um, looking at high intensity interval training in people with stroke. And if you don't think that's fun, so if any of you have tried high intensity interval training on your own, you know how challenging it is. And so um, we're doing this in stroke because there is some evidence um, that there's better outcomes um, with shorter amount of intervention, which we're really interested in given the limited rehab time we have with folks. So we're a site um, in a three site clinical trial. Um, Pierce Boyne here is the PI in Cincinnati. Carrie is his co-investigator. We're a site at Delaware on the PI, site PI for that. And then this is Sandy Billinger at Kansas. I put this up here just to let you know that there's, this is just the work that I'm directly involved in or indirectly involved in. Um, there's other work going on, um, as I mentioned, with um, looking at cognition and its effects. So if people are interested, um, if you have patients that you might that you think might be interested in participating. There's just, there's kind of something for everyone going on. And um, we have lots more we could 
come back and give lots more talks if people are interested. Um, just want to thank everybody in the lab, past and present, of course. Um, you know, this work is really done um, as part of a team, and we have lots of great people that help help us. So um, at this point, I would be happy to take any questions. Okay. So in your clip of slide, you said that you were you were you were doing the, the grouping on on the baseline. So are you doing the grouping within the three uh, among the three groups? Yeah. yeah. It's it's a great question. So we're we're not we're actually not powered to do that. So what we're really doing is we have a, a, the hypothesis that the group that actually has the lowest level of activity at the beginning is going to benefit the most from SAM, but we're not trying to make sure we're not we're just allowing randomization to take effect. So we're not doing anything where we're trying to make sure that we've got balanced groups if that's what you're asking. Yeah, no. No stratification. No, we're not powered to do that. Yeah. The other thing I will tell you is it's really interesting what you learn. So of course, the subgroup work that I'm showing you comes from the fact that we have the ProWalks baseline data. We didn't know, we had some hunches as I showed you some earlier data, but we didn't really know exactly all of the factors that are involved. And so if it turns out once we have the full cohort that these subgroups hold, um, you know, then we could go ahead and design an intervention, right? That's specifically targeted at a subgroup and then that is really where sort of that proof of concept idea that these subgroups exist and if you target interventions, I mean, that's really the ideal design, but we did not have that information or go into ProWox with that design in mind. And ProWox is really um, not meant to be a definitive trial. Um, it's really a phase two trial. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, the motivational interview, do you, uh, I mean, how does it work? Do you have people who are trained in motivational we, That's why we say we use motor, motivational interviewing type techniques. So we are not using the full complement of motivational interviewing. We're just using the principles of motivational interviewing. Yeah, we are not, because motivational interviewing would be an intervention in, unto itself. But we're using those, the, those type of techniques um, because the behavior change literature really suggests that those type of techniques can be quite effective. Um, so again, depending on what we see here, that could be another whole line of research, right? To look at really if you couple true motivational interviewing techniques with the physical capacity building, what would you see? Yeah. All right, thank you.